Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to discuss the cardiomyocyte action potential. This is the action potential that is moving throughout the muscle cells of the heart. And I want to make sure that's clear because we're going to distinguish that from the pacemaker potential. Pacemaker potential was something that went through the cells of the cardiac conduction system. Those were neurons. Those were the neurons that autorhythmically activate the muscle cells for contraction. So you kind of have to have the pacemaker potential first because without that, the muscle cells don't contract. But make sure you at least understand that these action potentials are for the cardiomyocytes. And they look different, and there's going to be some differences that we're going to see that we don't actually have in the pacemaker potential. And we're just going to look at this graphically in this video. And then in the next video, we'll actually look at the physiological events, what's going on during each phase. The cardiomyocytes have a resting membrane potential around negative 90 millivolts. And so in order to get the initial depolarization, we have to have the opening of voltage-gated sodium channels. And so through a mechanism we'll talk about in the next video, those voltage-gated sodium channels open and the membrane potential skyrockets to about positive 20 or positive 30 millivolts. All right? Now, when the membrane potential gets to about positive 30, that's going to trigger the sodium channels to close. And then we get the opening of voltage-gated potassium channels. That's in blue here. So notice opening of voltage-gated potassium channels for a very short amount of time. Okay, At least short amount of time where they're the only ones that are open. Okay, And when potassium channels are open, potassium efflux is out of the cell, which means you're moving positive charges out of the cell, and so the inside of the cell gets more negative, which is why we see the membrane potential fall a little bit. But here's the kicker in cardiac muscle, is that while the potassium channels remain open, we have voltage-gated calcium channels that also open. They're just a little bit slower in how they open. Okay, And so you have potassium channels open at the same time as calcium channels. So notice this segment between this dotted line and this dotted line. We have potassium and calcium open at the same time. And so any potassium ions that move out are balanced by calcium ions that move into the cell. And so because you have an, a net balance of ions, you pretty much have this plateau right here in the membrane potential. And again, the reason there's a plateau is because really for every potassium that moves out, you have a calcium that moves in, so to speak. And so the membrane potential does not appreciably change right here. This is what we call the plateau. And during the plateau, this is when we actually have cross bridge cycling and shortening of the sarcomere and overall contraction of that part of the heart. Okay, That's all going on during the plateau. Now I'll go ahead and mention this. The plateau is extremely important because it allows for the full movement of blood from that chamber before that chamber relaxes. We have to have the blood, for the most part, completely ejected from that particular chamber before that chamber starts to relax. Okay? If this segment were a lot shorter and it went directly to repolarization, there's no way that that chamber, whatever we're talking about, atria or ventricles, would completely uh, eject all the blood. Okay, And so we really wouldn't get much blood ejected per beat of the heart. And so this plateau extends the time for that to occur. So it's ensuring all the blood is pumped out of that chamber. All right? But again, this plateau is due to the fact that for every potassium that effluxes, you have a calcium that influxes. And so this is balanced. But there comes a time when the calcium channels close, but the potassium channels are still open. Right? So if the calcium channels inactivate and the potassium channels are still open, then potassium is still going to efflux out of the cell and the inside of the cell is going to become more negative. And so we have repolarization in which the membrane potential goes back to approximately negative 90 millivolts. Right? And then at this point, assuming there is activation via another pacemaker cell, we'd have another one of these action potentials. Okay? So just a brief recap here with this cardiomyocyte action potential. We have this initial depolarization that's due to the opening of voltage-gated sodium channels. Immediately after we get to about positive 30 millivolts, 
we have the opening of voltage-gated potassium channels, which causes a very brief repolarization. But at this point, calcium channels open. They're actually specifically L-type voltage-gated calcium channels. And then we get this plateau because we have both calcium and potassium channels open. And for every potassium that effluxes, we have a calcium that influxes so to speak. And so we get this flat line or this plateau, which ensures that the ventricles or the atria, really doesn't matter because this is happening in both types of cells, uh, that that chamber has time to completely eject the blood that it needs to prior to relaxation. And then over here, once that's occurred, voltage-gated calcium channels close, and we still have potassium channels open, which causes repolarization as those potassium ions efflux. And that brings us back down to resting membrane potential. And this would occur for each cell, each cardiomyocyte in the heart, one time per cardiac cycle. Okay. One thing I want to make clear about the cardiomyocyte action potential is this, we're just looking at one individual cell. It doesn't matter if this is an atrial cardiomyocyte or a ventricular cardiomyocyte. This is occurring for every single cardiomyocyte in the heart. Now, it may be at different times because, remember, the atria contract before the ventricles, and even within the ventricles, certain parts of them contract before others. But this process is happening for every individual cardiomyocyte in the heart. And this is only a look at one individual cell. When we go to the next video, this is going to represent one whole cell. And so this process that we're going to see, instead of looking at it graphically, we'll look at it you know, structurally. This is for one individual cell. Okay? The only reason I mention that is because sometimes students confuse the cardiomyocyte action potential with the electrocardiogram. The electrocardiogram is very different. We're going to cover that two videos from now after we talk more in detail about the cardiomyocyte action potential. But make sure you understand for now that this action potential diagram and the physiology that goes with it, this is just for one individual cell, but it's happening in all the cells of the heart in a particular cardiac cycle at different points in time in the cycle. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. If not, it will clear it up in the next video. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.